<clears throat> Today is the first Advent Sunday for 2018, and we're going to have three more sermons around the, the Christmas issues. Today is the first one. It's the real truth about Christmas. And I said I would be wearing a different hat today. I'm wearing uh, my hat as a historian and a historiographer. <clears throat> in, the, in the ancient world, the Near East and the Roman Empire at that time, this is called uh, academically a study of the classics, ancient Rome, ancient Israel, classical archeology, span classical history and the top universities in the world on this subject would be Cambridge, Oxford, University of California, Berkeley, Harvard and Stanford usually uh, round out the top five or six in this particular department in this particular area though there are other schools like Princeton and so forth uh, that are good in the Sorbonne and Italy. <clears throat> but I said I was going to address you as a historian, as a historiographer today, uh, and, and my background is certainly at the University of California, Berkeley for the PhD in historical studies, studying with some of the greatest scholars in the world on the issue of the truth about Christmas. I'm also going to say that all of my sources today are academically received across denominations, across Catholic, Orthodox, Protestant, Jewish, agnostic, atheist, um, in terms of their accuracy and their validity. One of my professors was Jack Finnegan, who was probably the leading archeologist and expert in chronology in the world back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. William Ramsey, the archeologist, Adolf von Harnack from Germany, A.N. Sherwin-White from Oxford, Bo Rika from Switzerland, Paul Alexander at UC Berkeley, Jewish and also a classical scholar, Ethelbert Stauffer, G. H. Stevenson, largely responsible for the Cambridge Ancient History, Adolf Diesman in Germany, A. T. Robertson in the United States and the Brit Britain, Harold W. Herner from Cambridge, and Nigel Turner and others. I have a letter uh, from C. H. Dodd, who was a uh, and most of these scholars are liberal. I had a letter from C.H. Dodd, who was the leading liberal critic of the first half, easily, of the 20th century, immensely respected. And in his personal letter to J.A.T. Robinson, he wrote that he felt that it was time to reinvestigate all of the early data around early Christianity and the birth of Christ and the creation of the New Testament because he was part of the leadership that went away from the traditions and he felt that it was time to go back and rigorously address those issues. J.A.T. Robinson at um, Cambridge and Oxford wrote, Redating the New Testament, a monumental work of tremendous scholarship. I give this to you as background because I said I'm addressing you today as a historian and a historiographer. And these are the points I want to make about the truth about Christmas. Jesus was actually born on December 25th in 5 BC. Jesus was actually born on December 25th of 5 BC. The shepherds tending their sheep were in the fields of Bethlehem and they tended those fields with sheep 12 months out of the year because those sheep were used for the sacrifice in the temple. It was never closed down. Joseph 
and Mary moved to Bethlehem, as recorded by the earliest Roman documents of registration and administration, because it was required for not only Joseph to be there since his parents had property, but it was required for Mary to be there as a witness about Joseph and the property. They were required to go. Next week, I'm going to get into the historical aspect about the census from Augustus, which was actually made between 7 and 6 BC. Joseph and Mary moved from the manger which was like a cave where the animals stayed, to a house in Bethlehem. And the shepherds came to them at the manger, but the Magi found them at a house because they got out of the manger as soon as they could. In later weeks, I'll address the astronomical phenomenon that took place, but not today. When the Magi visited Joseph and Mary and the baby Jesus in the house, it was January the 6th of 4 BC, born December 25th on Christmas Day. The Magi visited 12 days later on January the 6th. The baby Jesus was circumcised on the eighth day and his mother, Mary, according to the law for Jewish women, received her purification 40 days later. 40 days later. Joseph was warmed in a, in a dream about Herod because when he had talked to the Magi, he instructed them that after they went to this new king that was to be born in Bethlehem, to then return to him after they gave, after the Magi would give this new baby boy adequate adoration and respect, and then to come back to him that he might also go and pay his respects. After several weeks, they did not return. He began to get suspicious, and because of that, Joseph was warned in a dream and they fled to Egypt, probably on February the 4th. One of the things that you'll see, and I'll talk more about this in weeks to come, is that Luke, as a historian, when he talks about the ministry of Jesus, he keeps everything as much as possible in his narrative in Judea. In Judea, in the land of Judea, because he has a theme in Luke Acts that the gospel begins in Jerusalem and Bethlehem and goes out Judea, the rest of Israel, Samaria, and the othermost parts of the earth, eventually to the capital of the whole empire, which is Rome. And so that's a driving theme. So he doesn't mention uh, Egypt. He doesn't mention Caesarea. He doesn't mention the Decapolis. He doesn't mention all these other things that are referred to in Mark and Matthew and John because he has a particular theme. So you find the story of the wise men of the Magi in Matthew. Now, what's interesting when we get into the astronomical study on this, you're going to see that when the Magi left Ur, about 140 miles southeast of Babylon and made their way along the Euphrates to Herod and then down to Jerusalem and then to Bethlehem. That's a, that's a trek of about 1,300 miles. It would have taken them about 60 to 75 days to do that. And there are interesting astronomical phenomena attested from the astronomies of China through Babylon all the way into Egypt and the, the Middle East. We'll talk about that later. But believe me, when I talk about the scholarship behind what I've just shared with you that verifies the records in Luke and Matthew, the scholarship is first rate and not at all biased. These are the facts. What is interesting <clears throat> is that 
these scholars, secular scholars, treat the documents in Christianity like they treat the documents in the secular world. So the Roman registrations, the Roman records of the taxation, as well as the early writings of these Christians. Going all the way back to the time of Jesus, we have Papias, Polycarp, Justin Irenaeus, Hippolytus, Tertullian, and Cyprian. And what's really interesting is that both Justin Martyr writing about 150 AD and Tertullian writing in the early 200s says, as it relates to the taxation and the events described in Luke, he says, you can still go to the Roman administrative building in Jerusalem and in Syria and see for yourself that this is part of their recorded history. Why all the confusion? Why the urban legends of, you know, it was a pagan holiday and they decided to have Christmas on the pagan holiday in order to make it, you know, acceptable within the church. None of which is true. None of which is true. <clears throat> I want to talk about for a moment, again, I'm wearing my historian hat. I want to talk about Sol Invictus. There was an emperor in Rome by the name of Aurelian. He had come up from Dalmatia, uh, modern Serbia, and he served under an emperor in an elite capacity. He was head of the cavalry. His emperor got, got ill and died while he was fighting, leading, he was the general of the army by this time, while he was leading them and his troops declared him to be the next emperor, Emperor Aurelian. His mother was a priestess and a worshiper of the sun god. And in 274, he wanted to make the sun god the chief god in the pantheon of Rome. So he would be more significant than Jupiter in the Latin, Zeus in the Greek. He would be the most significant God over all the other gods that the Romans would worship. Emperor Aurelian obviously was not a Christian. You have to remember that from 64 AD under Nero until 312, 313 AD, from 64 AD until 313 AD, if you were a Christian, you could be fed to the animals, burned at a stake, had your head chopped off if you were a Roman citizen or, or killed. And someday we ought to have a series on the persecutions in, in, the, in that period of time. But you didn't publicly celebrate Easter. You didn't publicly celebrate your communion. You didn't, you didn't wear a cross around your neck because you'd be killed between 64 AD and 313. You didn't publicly celebrate the fact that Jesus was born on December 25th. Hippolytus, who was a student through Irenaeus and Justin of the Apostle John. Remember, John dies about 101 or two, overlapping with the lives of Papias and Polycarp, who were born between 30 and 50 AD and lived about 40 years with John. And they, and they taught Justin and Irenaeus, who taught Hippolytus. And he just casually mentions, and of, and of course, you know, we know that Jesus was born December 25th on a Wednesday in the 42nd year of Augusta. You know, I mean, it's, it's there in the, in the documents. But you didn't celebrate this stuff. It was private. It was secret. <clears throat> so Sol Invictus. Well, at any rate, back to Emperor Aurelian. He established Sol Invictus, that's the unconquerable son, Sol, Son, Invictus, Unconquerable. He established Sol Invictus in 274 AD as a national holiday for the Roman Empire. He had united East and West Roman empires once again. They had been fractured through a number of, of um, wars. And because of this, 
And because Christmas wasn't celebrated until 336 throughout the empire, people look back on this and say, oh, they just adapted to Sol Invictus, but that's not the case. Cyprian, as early as 250, is preaching on the fact that on Sol Invictus, on the son of righteousness from Malachi chapter 4, verse 2, he's saying Jesus is the real son of righteousness, S-U-N and S-O-N, with healing in his wings. The early church... John Chrysostom is one of the most articulate and learned men of his day. And he preached not only on the Tivity, December 25th, but he preached on the fact that the righteousness that's talked about in Malachi chapter 4, meaning the sun rising in the east on December 25th, was fulfilled when Christ was born on December 25th because he's the true S-U-N and S-O-N. Forty years earlier than Sol Invictus being a national holiday, the church for a hundred years had been preaching that Christ is the son of righteousness, the S-U-N of righteousness. So what happened in 336? When the Emperor Constantine became the first Emperor of Rome to become a Christian, and as he learned and studied more about Easter, baptism, communion, the Eucharist, the resurrection, the nativity, He said, let's celebrate this nationally. And so he instituted Christmas nationally. Why? Because it was no longer illegal to be a Christian. He stopped that in 313 AD. In 313 AD and began to nationalize the holidays. Why did he nationalize the holidays in 336 and not in 313? Because there was equal freedom of religion since he was a Christian emperor. If you were pagan, you could remain pagan. And he was hesitant to institutionalize any holiday that just favored one religion, even though he was a convert. Another black spot on this urban legend of confusing the fact that December 25th really is the birth date of Jesus Christ were the Puritans. They were anti-Catholic. They were poor historians. They were poor theologians. The Puritans, their thinking goes back to the Reformation. They didn't pay attention to the patristics and to the early Roman history and Greek history. And to be anti-Catholic, they, they made it in England impossible for the Puritans to celebrate Christmas. The people continued to celebrate Christmas. If you were Catholic, if you were Anglican, if you were independent, you celebrated Christmas. And under Oliver Cromwell, he had his reign for five years. And when, when he was no longer there, Christmas had become something that the colonists were split on. Washington, George Washington celebrated Christmas, but there were Puritans within America who still were anti-Catholic. They wouldn't, in spite of the fact that it was as old as the birth of their savior. Charles Dickens helped overcome that bias with the story of Christmas Carol. So that once again, even Puritans would celebrate Christmas. The more they thought about it, the more they realized that the resurrection from the dead, while great, while great, nobody had come back from the dead in a new body. 
that the incarnation, that God would become man, I'm speaking now as a historian about the doctrine of the church. I'm not preaching to you this morning under this. I'm stating the facts about Christmas. They realize the importance, the significance of the incarnation. God becoming flesh. And they realize that without God becoming flesh, he couldn't bear our sins in his body. He couldn't live and then die perfectly. And he couldn't rise if he had not become flesh. And so Christmas began to soar in popularity as the theologians began to reflect on the significance of December 25th. Finally, in conclusion, there was a man by the name of St. Nicholas. He was wealthy. His parents were wealthy. And like St. Francis of Assisi, one of my heroes, St. Francis of Assisi, like him, he gave all of his wealth to the poor and to children. To the poor and to children. And there is a little story written which represents, it'll take me about three minutes to read, which represents the spirit of giving in which St. Nicholas gave in the spirit in which God gave his only son. That, that's pointing to December 25th, as well as to Easter. It's called, it was the night before Christmas, written anonymously in 1823. And so all of you children and all of you children at heart, this is the original penned poem from that 1823 newspaper in which it was published. And it represents the true spirit of Christmas. Twas the night before Christmas when all through the house, not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. The stockings were hung by the chimney with care in hopes that St. Nicholas soon would be there. The children were nestled, all snug in their beds, while visions of sugar plums danced in their heads, and Mama in her kerchief and I in my cap had just settled our brains for a long winter's nap. When out of the lawn, there arose such a clatter, I sprang from my bed to see what was the matter. Away to the window, I flew like a flash, tore open the shutters and threw up the sash. The moon on the breast of the new fallen snow gave the luster of midday to the objects below, when what to my wandering eyes should appear but a miniature sleigh and eight tiny reindeer with a little old driver, but so lively and quick, I knew in a moment it must be St. Nick. More rapid than eagles, his coursers they came, and he whistled and shouted and called them by name. Now Dasher, now Dancer, now Prancer and Vixen, on Comet, on Cupid, on Dunder and Blixen. To the top of the porch, to the top of the wall. Now, dash away, dash away, dash away all. As dry leaves before the wild hurricane, fly. When they meet an obstacle, mount sky high. So up to the house, housetop, the coursers they flew with a sleigh full of toys and St. Nicholas too. And then in a twinkling, I heard on the roof, the prancing and pawing of each little hoof. As I drew in my head and was turning around, down the chimney, St. Nicholas came with a bound. He was dressed all in fur, from his head to his foot, 
and his clothes were all tarnished with ashes and soot. A bundle of toys was flung on his back and he looked like a peddler just opening his pack. His eyes, how they twinkled, his dimples, how merry. His cheeks were like roses, his nose like a cherry. His draw little mouth was drawn up like a bow and the beard of his chin was as white as the snow. The stump of a pipe he held in his teeth and the smoke it encircled his head like a wreath. He had a broad face and a little round belly that shook when he laughed like a bowl full of jelly. He was chubby and plump, a right jolly old elf. And I laughed when I saw him in spite of myself. A wink of his eye and a twist of his head soon gave me to know I had nothing to dread. He spoke not a word but went straight to his work and filled all the stockings, then turned with a jerk and laying his finger aside of his nose and giving a nod, up the chimney he rose. He sprang to his sleigh, to his team, gave a whistle, and away they all flew like the down of a thistle. But I heard him exclaim before he drove out of sight. Happy Christmas to all and to all a good night. And I want to close by saying as Christians, we are to be this kind of giving to those in need as Christians. We are to be servants to all who need help. Please bow with me. Father, we thank you that you so love the world that you gave your only begotten son. That whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. May we give as you gave. May we forgive as you forgive. May we follow the example that Jesus said. He said, follow me. Take up your cross daily and follow me and give. And he said, I came to serve. I came to serve. Let us live out our faith in love, in joy. We ask you to bless all those in the world, to bless the leaders, to lead them as much into peace as possible. We pray, Father, most of all, that we might become more like Christ in our heart and in the outliving of that. In Christ's name, amen. <clears throat> We're in a series on Advent Sundays. Advent Sundays go back in the early church, and they're the Sundays that prepare us for the celebration of the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And last week, when I addressed you, I said I wasn't addressing you so much as a pastor, but I was putting on my hat as the historian. And I said, the reason I wanted to do that is because there was so much confusion about Christmas. And afterwards, I had a couple of people um, comment um, there may be people in the congregation who are not aware of the confusion about Christmas. And so I want to make that clear that one of the things that uh, for a long time was taught in seminaries was that uh, December 25th was not really the birthday of Jesus Christ, that the church just accommodated it to a pagan festival in um, the 300s and started celebrating it so it's not really christian it's not really biblical and um also that the um the wise men coming in in the book of matthew to to jesus to honor him was uh, more fantasy than fable and is not really historical 
And uh, Epiphany, January 6th, is just another arbitrary accommodation to another celebration. And so I said when I addressed you last week that I wanted to wear my historian hat and that um, I tried to give you some qualifications there that my PhD was in historical studies with the most liberal and the most famous scholars in the world at the time at the University of California, Berkeley, at Hebrew University, at Yale and Harvard, and at the Graduate Theological Union. And uh, uh, all of the sources that I addressed were uh, accepted throughout uh, the academic world. And so we established last week that indeed December 25th is the day that Jesus Christ was born and that is borne out by the early church as well as other phenomena that we're going to talk about today. And that not only Tertullian, um, an early church father, but also Hippolytus of Rome, of, of, of the Roman Catholic Church at the, uh, in the second century, talks about December 25th as the day that Jesus was actually born in Bethlehem. And then we mentioned also that John Chrysostom in the early church in about 385 was one of the most articulate and learned Bible scholars in his day. He was a fabulous preacher, a lot like Billy Graham or Charles Hayden Spurgeon. And John Chrysostom makes the point that the Eastern Church, the church in Egypt, Alexandria, the church in Palestine and Asia Minor and Constantinople, that the Eastern Church, much of it is the Greek Orthodox or the Eastern Orthodox Church today, that they didn't have the birth date of Jesus down accurately, but that the church at Rome and the Western Church had December 25th accurately from the very beginning from the very beginning of the preaching of the gospel. So he, as a learned scholar, was trying to explain to the congregation why we should be celebrating Christmas on December 25th and Epiphany on the 6th when the, when the wise men came. And last week we talked about the various scholars such as Adrian Nicholas Sherwin White. It's funny how the British when they always have four or five names, you, you wonder if they're doing a genealogical tree or something. Um, and Hugh Last and uh, Fergus Miller, with names like that, you know they had to be great scholars because nobody would take them seriously otherwise. Um, William Ramsey, Adolf von Harnack, and I wanna, I wanna make a point on this because I wanna nail this down. When we said that Jesus was born December 25th, uh, most probably in BC 5, and that the um, Magi, the wise men came on January 6, most probably um, January the 4th. Adolf von Harnack was the greatest scholar of the late 19th century, that's 1800s, and, and 20th, early 20th century that the world has ever seen. He had the New Testament memorized in Greek and he had much of the Old Testament memorized in Hebrew and Greek. And he was a phenomenal scholar. He was a liberal. He did not accept the Bible as you know, the inerrant word of God. He didn't believe that it was historical. And he thought that the Gospel of Luke and Acts were completely wrong about almost everything. And there was another scholar who was an agnostic and then he became an atheist and his name was William Ramsey out of Oxford and William Ramsey set out because he was trained in classics and archaeology and particularly in classical studies he set out to the Holy Land to Palestine to prove that the New Testament was absolute trash both of his parents were atheists and they hated the Christian religion. And in his efforts, and he was, he was a remarkable archeologist. I mean, the world raved about him. And when I say the world, I don't mean the Christian world. I mean the academic world. He set out to prove everything was false. In two years, 
he became a believer because he found evidence after evidence after evidence after evidence that the New Testament was true and that the secular sources, whenever they disagreed with the New Testament, it turned out the New Testament was true. And he influenced with his findings, he influenced, he influenced the objective thinker Adolf von Harnack. Now remember, Adolf von Harnack was, was, he didn't believe in the, that Jesus was God. He didn't believe he died and rose from the dead. He didn't believe he walked on water. He didn't believe the Bible was even a good historical record. And so he said, you know, I'm going to look at this thing again. And he did over about a 20 year period. And he said, Harnack came to the conclusion that there was probably no more accurate historian in the history of the world than Luke, who he believed wrote the gospel and the book of Acts. And so when I draw on these scholars, I'm talking about real solid scholarship from secular unbelievers who substantiate what I said about December 25th and January the 6th. Probably the greatest scholar in the English language or German or French or Italian, as far as that goes, is Jack Finnegan on biblical chronology. There isn't a single one better. He was one of my professors. And before he died, he was able to finish revising his handbook of biblical chronology on, on all of these issues, Old and, and, and New Testament. And, you know, he was convinced December 25th was the birth date of Jesus Christ and January 6th was uh, the day when the wise men showed up. And then there's Harold W. Herner I referred to from Cambridge University who wrote a little tiny book called The Chron Chronological Aspects of the Life of Jesus Christ. And uh, it's a very good book. It's a very good book. And I speak to you, not as a pastor here, but as a historian. Um, but, you know, th this is the world I lived in. This was my profession. This was my training. These guys are for real. I want to say, before I get into uh, today's sermon, that <clears throat> this stuff is very difficult for the amateur to handle very complicated and you, you have a couple of outlier scholars um, who uh, use the manuscripts and so forth in, in not the best way. So if, if you wanna seriously study some of this, just ask me and I'll point you to some, some good authors and some good articles by those authors. I wanna reemphasize once again that the early church's tradition and by tradition, I mean the historical record and facts were kept solidly, genuinely, and accurately, primarily in the Church of Rome, primarily in the West. The East had all kinds of problems with heresies from the very beginning, Arianism, Sibelianism, Nestorianism, and every ism you can, Gnosticism, and every ism you can think of. And they all looked to Rome to say, what was the teaching of the early church? And they looked as long as he was alive and Polycarp and uh, Justin Martyr and Irenaeus and Hippolytus were alive, the disciples of the apostle John, they looked to Ephesus as well. <coughs> we are thankful for the work that these people did to maintain not only our scriptures accurately, but also the records about our scriptures. So today is the truth about Christmas part two. Last week we dealt with Luke's account and today we're gonna to emphasize Matthew's account. And the first thing I wanna talk about today is love your enemies. Love your enemies. We had a series on the Sermon on the Mount when we talked about becoming more like Jesus Christ. What we are here and all about is how do we become more like Jesus Christ? The outline today is love your enemies, 
the gift, number one. Number two, the gift of God. Number three, a king at birth. And number four, a star is born. Number one, love your enemies. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount says he wants us to love our enemies. Not, not just pray about, not just be in deference to, but to love our enemies. And he says... I want you to understand this, that unless your righteousness exceeds the Bible scholars' righteousness and the Pharisees, the most religious and strict theology in Judaism, unless your righteousness exceeds that, you will never enter God's kingdom of heaven. And he says this, in the context of love your enemies that this is ultimately fundamentally what is characteristic of somebody who's truly born again remember he says you cannot even see the kingdom of god if you're not born again or born from above but a characteristic an attribute of that is loving your enemies he goes on both later in matthew 5 and also in luke chapter 6 to make this point He says, you can love your family, you can love your friends, you can love those who do well for you. That's no different than the average person who doesn't believe in God. That counts for nothing. Even those who don't believe in God love their family, love their children, love their friends, love those who are kind to them, do well by them. He says, you must be like your father in heaven who loves his enemies. Would God ask us to do anything that he himself already does not do? You see, if if God didn't love his enemies then he would be a hypocrite because he tells us to love our enemies. He not only says to love our neighbor as ourself, but he gives a reason for it. He says, be holy for I am holy. In other words, I do this. He, God does not ask you or me to do anything that he isn't already doing or has done. When he says, to pray and love those who despitefully use us. Think about that. Despitefully, that means they intentionally manipulate you, slander you, fraud you, rape you, kill you, blackmail you, whatever. And we're to love them. Why? Because God loves them. He loved us while we were still enemies. There's a whole there's a whole discussion that I need to have about what election is and what election is not. And it's certainly not the tulip doctrine. John Calvin didn't even believe that. In his commentary on 1 John chapter 2, verse 2, he says, when We talk about Christ as the propitiation, not only for us. That means the mercy seat, not only for us, but for the whole world. He means the whole world, not the whole world of the elect. God doesn't just love the elect. He loves every single person, every single angel, fallen or unfallen, with all his heart. Paul was a brilliant theologian. He was a brilliant Bible scholar. He was a brilliant person. And he says that he worked harder than every other apostle, including Peter. He said he did more than Peter. And and Peter is the one that Jesus said on you, I'm going to build my church. 
And we know the one foundation that no man can lay is Jesus Christ the Lord, 1 Corinthians 3, 11. But on top of that foundation is Peter and Paul and James and John and Matthew and so forth. Paul says, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Paul says, I worked more than all the other apostles. And Paul says, no matter what I do for Jesus, if I don't do it with real love, it profits me nothing. I get zero credit. God may have given you a high IQ. Maybe your IQ is 190 or 200. God may have given you a wonderful singing voice. God may have made you six feet five or four foot three. Whatever the gifts are that God gave you, the one thing every single one of us has, every single one of us has, is a heart that can be given completely over to truth and love and kindness and patience and honesty and integrity and romance and beauty or a heart that can be given over to self and whatever inclinations we may have different from different personalities different hormonal groups on and on and on we all have a heart to receive or reject to love or to hate or to be apathetic to or indifferent to Love your enemies. And this leads us to the greatest love that there has ever been, the gift of God. I had an aunt <clears throat> who, when I was 15 years old, I was in St. Louis out. They had about 10 or 15 acres in a little lake. And... Uh, we had just had, you know, barbecues and fireworks and all kinds of games and swimming and everything. They had their own little cannon uh, they could shoot off. And, and this aunt said to me, uh, because I had been studying uh, the Bible seriously since I was about 12 years old. And so she said, uh, Ricky, my family calls me Ricky. And um, you got to love that. And she said, I, I don't understand God. And I said, well, get in line. And she said, no, what I mean is, if I really love my son, why would I send him to die and, and become sin for us? Why wouldn't I do it? I don't, I don't get that. And I said, why do you say that? She says, well, I love my children. Rocky and Barbie, I love my children more than anything more than myself and i said well don't you think that god the father loves his son more than anything more than himself she thought for a while she said yeah that's probably true i said you know we're made in his image if you love your children and i said you know it's very normal for parents to love their children more than they love themselves they would they give their lives for their children as proof they endure bad marriages for their children. They endure bad careers for their children. They endure bad children for their children. And she thought about that for a while and she said, um, yeah, I guess that means that he loved us so much that he gave the thing, the person he loved more than anything. So I could live. For God so loved the world, cosmos, the Greek, it means the whole world. It doesn't mean the world of the elect. That's a lie of faulty scholarship. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And you've heard me over and over and over say that it's important to read the next several verses. It talks about those who don't accept him 
rejecting, <clears throat> intentionally rejecting. So we have to be very careful as we as we preach the gospel and as as um, As Assisi said, use words if necessary. You preach the gospel by living a life of love and kindness and truth and gentleness and patience. That's how you preach the gospel. And when Paul says that when Jesus returns, he's going to bring those who are saved with him, he doesn't say, those who are baptized by immersion, those who are christened. He doesn't say those who believe in a pre-tribulational rapture or those who believe in the mid-tribulational rapture or those who believe in election or those who believe in whatever. He says those who believe that Jesus died and rose again. That's the Orthodox Church. That's the Roman Catholic Church. That's all the Protestants individually who believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the one qualification for who Christ brings with him. And we have that privilege because God loved us when we were yet enemies. God loved us when we couldn't do anything to save ourselves. He gave his son, his son. He would have much rather have given himself. He gave what he knew was the greatest expression of love that he could give. I want you to turn to Isaiah chapter 48, verse 12. I've got about 12 minutes left. Isaiah chapter 48, verse 12. Listen to me, Jacob. This is, this is the Lord God, Jehovah speaking. This is Jehovah in the Old Testament, Yahweh in the Old Testament. Listen to me, Jacob, Israel, whom I have called. I am he. I am the first and I am the last. My own hand laid the foundations of the earth and my right hand spread out the heavens. Jehovah's talking. It's earlier in chapter 48 and previous to that. This is Jehovah speaking. When I summon them, they all stand up together. Come together, all of you, and listen. Which of the idols has foretold these things? The Lord's chosen ally will carry out his purpose against Babylon. His arm will be against the Babylonians. I, even I, have spoken. Yes, I have called him, and I will bring him, and he will succeed in his mission. Come near me and listen to this. From the first announcement, I have not spoken in secret. At the time it happens, I am there. Actually, that's from the beginning, I am there is a better Hebrew. <clears throat> and now the sovereign Lord, that is now Yahweh Almighty, has sent me, endowed with his spirit. Now, who's speaking? Jehovah is speaking. Jehovah, Yahweh, is speaking. When Moses says, what is your name? And he says, my name is Jehovah, or my name is Yahweh. It's I am that I am. Tell them that the I am has sent you. This is Jehovah speaking, and he says, the sovereign Lord has sent me and his spirit. This is what the Lord says, your redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. I am the Lord, your God, who teaches you what is best for you, who directs you in the way you should go. If only you had paid attention to my commands, your peace would have been like a river, your well-being like the waves of the sea. Your descendants would have been like the sand, your children like its numberless grains. Their name would never be blotted out nor destroyed from before me. If you had believed and obeyed, because if you believe but don't obey, you don't really believe. But this is Jesus speaking in the Old Testament. He says earlier that every knee will bow to him and every tongue will confess that he is in fact God. Jesus says in the New Testament, I am the I am. 
John 8. He says, I am the first and the last. Revelation 1, Revelation 22. He says, to me, every name shall bow and confess. This is what, this is what Jehovah has said of himself. And he's clearly the person who's speaking here. Because whom did the Father send? He sent his Son, the greatest gift. His Son, Jesus Christ, who was born December 25th. Now we get to the main part of the sermon, which I'll finish hopefully in five minutes and pick up next week. A king is born. An important thing to understand is that in the Old Testament, Isaiah 49, 7, in particular, it talks about the kings of the earth paying homage and worshiping the Messiah. Beginning with Isaiah 49, 7, Isaiah 60, Psalm 72, I can go on and on. The point is that those are ultimately fulfilled during the millennial reign of Christ. He comes a second time and sets up his physical kingdom before the new heaven and the new earth. This was the universal belief of the church in the first 350 years of its existence. But God always has in the first coming of the Messiah, he always has little bits that partially fulfill their ultimate fulfillment. And what he has is the Magi who come from the nations, they're not Jews, and they pay homage to him. And they say he is a king from birth. When they go to Herod, they say, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? And they bring gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Gold was a gift you gave a king. Frankincense was a gift you gave a deity. And myrrh was an expensive gift that you gave for somebody in death. Now, I have a lot more to say about this, but I'm going to cover it next week. I want to end on the, on the fi final point. A star is born. I'm not referring to the movie with... Um, Judy Garland or Barbara Streisand or Lady Gaga in Numbers chapter 24 verse 17 it says a star shall arise out of Jacob and what happened around the time of the birth of Christ are two are actually three or four events one was a, was Jupiter and Saturn coming together in uh, the Pisces constellation. And Pisces in those days was associated with Israel, with Palestine. And the second was the two of those stars moving on and coming together in Orion, which was associated with the tribe of Judah. So not just Israel, but of the line of Judah. In addition, there were supernova and comets that would point eventually directly to the location. And we're gonna talk about that next week. A star is born because a star in scripture not only is a star, but it's also an angel and it's also a significant person like a Messiah. So a star shall arise out of Jacob. So the wise men who probably came from the area in Babylon, although there are things I'll talk about next week about Nabataea and, and Arabia and so forth. But when they saw these things, they knew from their astronomy that it, that it had to do with Israel. It had to do with Israel. Then they knew it had to do with the tribe of Judah. And ultimately they knew it had to be a king, the Messiah, that even in their Zoroastrian background, they expected. A star is born. And I'll go into all the historical references to nail down, these were real, not fantasy, what their trip was like, what they were like. One final comment. I told you about when Hezekiah's engineers 
done through this this 1,500 foot area through solid rock coming together a centimeter apart. And they were taking credit for the brilliance of their engineers. This is in Isaiah 22, although the incident is obviously in Kings. But they were taking credit for this marvelous achievement. And God said the criticism he had of their marvelous achievement is that they didn't give him, God, credit for having planned this very feat long ago. It is no coincidence that we have three gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. It is no coincidence that these people saw the signs in the heavens that led them to where they had to go. And we'll talk about how they arrive at a house instead of the manger. And we'll talk about um, some other historical things that you need to know in order to have complete grasp of this. This is a miracle that God planned long ago. Let me encourage you with this conclusion. Love your enemies. Love as he loved us. You know, I have a theory that a husband will be faithful to a wife and a wife will be faithful to a husband that lovers will be faithful to each other to the extent that they're faithful to God. We need to open our hearts, humble our hearts, and love. Love. Knowledge puffs up. Knowledge puffs up but love brings about the salvation of life. Bow with me, please. Father, we thank you for your love. We thank, for, we thank you for your faithfulness. We ask that you make us genuinely in our heart of hearts humble, loving, like Jesus. Through the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit, because of the blood that was shed by Jesus Christ. Amen. We've been in a series on Advent Sundays. <clears throat> and in the first sermon, I mentioned that I was coming to you not as your pastor, but I was wearing my historian and historiographer hat. And what was really interesting is that as I've studied the history of um, Christmas from the original manuscripts and, and documents so that we could uh, depose of, of, of a lot of the urban myths and misunderstandings, I came to a number of people who are used, you are used to hearing preach, uh, people like John MacArthur and, and others, whether Tony Evans or John Piper or David Jeremiah or whatever, and whenever any one of them got into this kind of thing about the historicity both of uh, Luke and of Matthew, they, uh, uh, they would say, you know, I'm not really preaching to you, now I have to, I have to teach you about this history or something to that effect. So um, there's just a lot to grasp. And I want to give you a quick review before we get into the third lesson on the truth about Christmas that we're going to address today, focusing on, this, on the star, the, the astronomical phenomenon of the star, as well as who were the, the people, the, um, the Magi. So what I want to say is that we said right off the bat that there was an urban myth, or, or it was actually even for a while taught in seminaries in the late 1900s and the early 20th century, so it influenced a lot of ministers across denominations that Christmas was just accommodated to a pagan holiday called the celebration of Sol Invictus on um, December the 25th. 
Sol Invictus was actually celebrated December 20th through the 22nd, not on December 25th until later when Aurelian declared in 284 AD that that uh, particular date would celebrate Sol Invictus. And Christmas had been uh, taught that Jesus was born December 25th uh, from the time of his birth. And in that first sermon, we talked about the early Christian historians and writers who supported that, particularly Hippolytus of Rome, and that in the East, when we got to John Chrysostom, he made clear that the teaching that Christ was actually born December 25th was known in the Western Church, primarily um, guarded by Rome and so forth, from, from the beginning, and that the Eastern Church had come to to be clear on that later. And we cited uh, Cyprian and others. We also pointed out that both Justin Martyr, who was a disciple of John the Apostle, as well as Irenaeus, who was um, a disciple of John through Justin and Polycarp the Apostle, and um, Tertullian. Tertullian and Justin Martyr, or Justin writing, um, about 135, 145, and Tertullian writing at the turn of the century around 200, said that you could still go into the Roman administrative buildings and see the records of the enrollment of Joseph and Mary and the birth of Christ. So in uh, whether it was Justin's apology or Tertullian in his treatise against Marcion or whatever, the, the data was not only supported verbally, but it was footnoted and referenced against Roman records in, uh, in, in that period of time. And we went on to talk about the fact that one of the important things is to understand the different messages of the gospel that Luke is presenting Jesus as the son of man. And it's important that he be seen as the shepherd of all mankind. And his genealogy goes back to Adam. He's not just a Jew, which he, he was, but he's, he's, uh, he's the, the son of God as Adam was the, the first created one. And so he, he represents all mankind. He's for the Jew and the Gentile. And as a result of that, Luke emphasizes in his gospel special themes about his outreach and his work to women and to Gentiles. Matthew, on the other hand, focuses on Jesus as the king of the Jews, as the promised Messiah in the Old Testament, and he emphasizes that aspect. So in the genealogy of Luke, you have it going back through Mary, a woman, and you have that genealogy going back to Adam for all mankind. But in the genealogy in Matthew, you have it going back to Abraham, the first Jew, and it shows the kingly line to Joseph. Mary is the bloodline to King David through Nathan, and Matthew is the legal royal line through Solomon to David. I mentioned also that in the book of Matthew that, that he avoids mentioning anything other than Palestine whenever possible. And, um, uh, or I meant to say Luke, that Luke avoids mentioning anything other than Palestine whenever possible because his message in Luke Acts is that the gospel starts in Jerusalem, in Bethlehem, Jerusalem, and it goes out to Samaria and then to the rest of the Gentile world. So that even when Jesus is in foreign places, their, their names are not given. Matthew, on the other hand, is showing this Jewish Messiah who is going to travel to Egypt and, and, and um, out of Egypt have I called my son and so forth. So you have these, these Holy Spirit or literary themes that mark each version. And so when we concentrate on Matthew, one of the things that comes to mind in today's outline is this, and that is that the, the visit of the Magi and the star 
have been perceived, especially through the first part of the 20th century, as complete fiction. And what's interesting, um, as, as you know, my background is extremely liberal, extremely secular in its education. And um, I, I, uh, I, I answered one person uh, about, about that on a question, and I said, you know, the more I studied, the more conservative I, I, I became. But it wasn't just me, it was also the, the scholarship in reaction to this liberalism, you know, it's like a pendulum it began to swing back the other way with more and more data, more and more facts, more and more archaeology, more and more reflection, and certainly more and more PhDs uh, from all these schools. <clears throat> but it is, it is not a myth, it is not a fiction, it is not a fable. It is a certainty. I want to give you an example of how these things happen. Memnon of Heraclea, writing on the life of Mithridates, who lived uh, about 100 years before Christ, was writing in, in his history, and this was picked up by other historians during that period, that at the conceptions of Mithridates, the sixth Eupator, that means noble father, that at his conception, there was a, 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 a star, a sweeping star or comet in the heavens that was as bright brighter than the sun and, and occupied about a quarter or a third of the heavens. And also at his accession, when he came to the throne, that Mithridates said there was a second comet that appeared like the first. The first comet lasted for 70 days and the second one longer than 70 days. Now, Western historians, including those who were teaching me in the early 60s, that's 1960s, not 1860s. <laughs> Those who were teaching me, they dismissed all of this. Uh, um, Memnon, uh, the historian of Heraclea, didn't know what he was talking about. And the other histo historians, whether Herodotus or Josephus or the Roman historians or whatever, they didn't know what they were talking. This is, this is imaginary junk. Not so. I told you that one of my professors is considered the greatest chronologist, Old and New Testament, in the world of the 20th century, Jack Finnegan. And he revised uh, the book he was using when I was there in 1998. He revised it, you know, some 30 some odd years later. And uh, this is what happened. Not only the Western manuscripts but in China, they found carefully kept astronomical chronologies, impeccably kept, verified by the Royal Observatory in England and the best astronomers in the United States and Germany and Sweden and so forth that went back and checked. They found the same exact records in China that when when Mithridates was conceived in 134 BC, they described the same comet occupying the same kind of brightness and the same amount of the sky. They know nothing about Mithridates. They're over here in China, not in the Middle East. And at his accession in 120 BC, they have another record of a comet that's described as 70, longer than 70 days, longer than 70 days, independent records, completely independent records, Middle East and Roman, and completely uncommunicated Chinese. We find the same things with the star of the Magi, with the star of the Magi. What's interesting is that jo Joseph Needham, one of the great scholars of uh, Cambridge, was, was asked by Cambridge to set up a research institute and writing on uh, the phenomena of Mithridates. And believe me, those comets from Mithridates, see, we're going to apply all of this to the story of Jesus and the star of Bethlehem. They were all dismissed as fiction, fable, by all my liberal teachers. In any case, writes Joseph Needham, 
It was carefully watched at both ends of the world. So a comet precisely dated in Chinese sources was visible in the Mediterranean in 134 BC, as was the other in 120 BC, precisely the years and months of the begetting and the accession to kingship of Mithridates the sixth Eupator, according to our traditional Middle Eastern and Roman records. And the record of Pompeius Trogas, a Roman, about the Stella Cometes, which appeared to signalize those events, is substantiated. It's not a fable. We're going to run into the same things with the Star of Bethlehem. There are going to be two discussions here today. I may have to take this into the fourth Advent Sunday and even the, the, the fifth, the, the one after uh, Christmas. But there's two discussions. While the birth day date of Christ is secure at 25 of November, December 25th, that's secure. And the epiphany when the, when the wise men came January 6th, as I mentioned in my first sermon, if Herod died in 4 BC, which you can look up any source and it's gonna list Herod as having died in 4 BC. There was uh, a lunar eclipse shortly before he died and then there was Passover right after, after he died. And that fits um, um, a couple of years and in 4 BC, the, the uh, lunar eclipse took place about 29 and a half days uh, before Passover. And there's five or six things that they had to do. But the, the long and the short of it is that Herod most probably died in 4 BC. <clears throat> this is the astronomical data that accompanies that death in 4 BC between March 29th and April 5th. First of all, in 7 BC, there was three appearances of the conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn in Pisces. Pisces is the constellation that represented Israel to the Magi and to the astronomers of that day. Jupiter represented the chief god. Saturn was considered the planet of the house of Israel. And it was in Pisces associated with Palestine. That conjunction happened three times in BC 7. <clears throat> in BC 6, Mars entered into that conjunction. So you had Jupiter, Saturn, and Mars. And Mars represented a sinister influence, which meant that there was going to be persecution and hostility at the birth of this king. All of these signified a king. Now in BC 5, in March of BC 5, you begin to have a comet take place. And the comet lasted for more than 70 days and it's described in the Chinese language. You get this out of the Chinese Chronicles, it's described in the Chinese language as a sweeping star, a sweeping star. And that meant that the king was about to be born. Remember we said that if Herod died in 4 BC, Christ was born December 25, December 25th, 5 BC. And then after that, you had another comment that preceded the, the death of Herod that had a fixed tail, not a sweeping tail, that also signified this event had taken place. A Cuban astrophysicist reviewed Colin Humphrey's book on the star of Bethlehem. Colin Humphrey's is a Cambridge physicist, astrophysicist. And he, he's proposing that in fact, this, these are the, the astronomical phenomenon that was seen 
just prior to the birth of Christ. Guillermo Gonzalez, as an astronomer and as an astrophysicist, reviewed the work and concurs. I just want to read you what, what Humphrey said in, um, in his conclusion on these events. He says, the combination of three unusual and significant astronomical events caused the Magi to set off on their journey. First, there was a triple conjunction of Saturn and Jupiter in the constellation Pisces in 7 BC. That's where it, it happens three times in that year. March, October, December. Such an event occurs once every 900 years. Second, in 6 BC, an event occurs massing the three planets, Saturn and Jupiter and Pisces with Mars, Mars being a sinister or hostile influence. Such a massing only occurs every 800 years and very much more infrequently in Pisces. Third, a comet in 5 BC in the east in the constellation Capricornus, which also stood for um, Israel, in the, in, in the astronomy slash astrology of the time, a common in the East signified a rapidly approaching event, the birth, the birth of the king. So here is, a, here is a secular astrophysicist who's going back and saying these are the events astronomically that would have preceded the birth, December 25th, if it happened in 5 BC, and in fact, Herod died in 4 BC. There was a light that went from the star. That word star in Greek can be planet, star, comet. There was a light that went from the star over Bethlehem, down over Bethlehem. And there is another astronomer, Conradin Ferrari de Acepo, an Austrian astronomer, who talks about the zodiacal light, which is light like the Milky Way, and what happens when a planet is in this condition is that it's light. When you're looking at it from the north, the light will appear to travel down like over a city. Very interesting. Now there is a possibility, there are a couple of scholars that indicate that they think that Herod died in 1 BC. And I think the evidence is monumental against that. But in the event that Herod died in 1 BC, Christ still would have been born December 25th. The only thing in question would have been the year. The wise men still would have come as recorded January 6th. The only thing in question would have been the year. There was additional appearing of planets prior to 1 BC and 2 BC and 3 BC additional conjunctions of Jupiter and Venus in Leo, which represented the line of Judah. Now let's deal with the Magi. And I'll get this started and finish next week. The Magi go back further than Babylon and they were a priestly and royal class. They created for the Babylonians and for the Persians, they created the laws that the king approved. They were like the Congress. They created the laws that the king approved and once it was law, it couldn't be revoked. They're active at the time of Esther they're discussed in Daniel, Esther, and Jeremiah. We have them recorded in secular historians like Herodotus, Cetius, Strabo, other Roman historians, Greek historians. We have them in the early patristics with Clement, Ignatius, Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, Tertullian, even Jerome. They were a powerful group and they were nicknamed kingmakers 
because without their approval, they formed a council called the Magastani, and without their approval, you couldn't be king. And the, even the king in the Medo-Persian Empire had to study their, their science and their astronomy before they would crown them king. They lost some of their prestige after the conquest of Alexander the Great, but they remained extremely influential. And in the Roman Empire, when Rome took over the ascendancy, there were a number of magi that moved into the Roman area, into Egypt, into Arabia, into Nabataea. So they were all over the place, and some of them were charlatans like Simon Magnus and Elamas in Acts chapter 8 and chapter 13. But primarily, they were an educated order of priests and astronomers. They continued in the eastern part of the world there, east of the Euphrates, in the nation of Parthia. Parthia was a country that was continually at war with Rome. And when they weren't at war, they would have an uneasy peace. Rome feared Parthia. They feared the armies beyond the Euphrates. The great Roman Empire under Augustus, under Tiberius, and all the emperors in between were very wary of Parthia. Parthia continued to look for a Messiah that would conquer Rome, a king to be born that would conquer Rome. Now, what's interesting is that, that uh, John MacArthur's sources at uh, the Master's College go into the influence that Daniel had over the Magi. If you remember, Nebuchadnezzar made Daniel the head of all the Magi in Babylon. And so the theory is that the teaching of Daniel with the Jewish prophecies of Isaiah that Daniel would have known and Jeremiah that Daniel certainly knew and, and certainly the revelations that Daniel received from Gabriel about the coming Messiah and when this would all happen, that this would have influenced the content of the Magi cast within the, the empire. And that makes a lot of sense and certainly nobody can disprove that. But it's a fact that part of their teaching was that they were expecting a Messiah to be born that was going to conquer Rome, the Roman Empire, and be King of Kings and Lord of Lords. What the personal faith of these Magi that went to worship Jesus was, I don't know. They could have been straight from those influenced from Daniel's time on through Esther, that we're looking forward to that star of Jacob. Remember last week, a star shall rise out of Jacob. Numbers 24, 17. They could have been looking for that king to be born that would conquer Rome. But they went to worship and pay homage to Jesus with gifts of gold for a king, frankincense for a god, and myrrh for death. I think one of the most potent verses in this recorded event is what they told Herod. We have come to see him who has been born. It's actually an heiress passive participle, him who has been born king of the Jews. He was born a king, fulfilling Old Testament prophecy. And that is Matthew's point. This is your promised Messiah. This is the one that's going to be killed for you. Daniel chapter 9. He's a king from birth. Let me close with this observation. The early church recognized the significance of Easter. That was the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It made all the sense in the world. You can read the, uh, the epistle to the Romans. 
you can, you can see that the resurrection, you can read what uh, Dr. Scott's taking you through in the book of Hebrews, that, that with the resurrection and the perfect sacrifice, you have the, you have the blood that covers all the sins. You have the propitiation that First John talks about for the whole world and especially those who believe. You have clearly in the resurrection a new hope, life everlasting in fellowship with God. In the resurrection, it wasn't difficult to understand that here was a God man who could actually overcome the impossible. So celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ was quite easy to do from the very beginning, even though it was celebrated in secret. Remember, we said that, you know, it was a persecuted religion. So they celebrated it in the catacombs and they illustrated it and all that sort of stuff. But the more they thought about December 25th, and this is what's important to understand, the more they thought about December 25th, the more they came to realize the power of the words in the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was face to face with God, and God himself was the Word, and the Word became flesh. Word equals God equals flesh. The incarnation, the more they realized that the resurrection was not possible without the incarnation. That their sins couldn't be covered if it wasn't a perfect person who was substituted for them. And that substitution, that blood wouldn't be sufficient if it weren't divine blood. That's why in the book of Acts, chapter 20, verse 28, it says that the blood of God was shed. the church of God whose blood was shed. And we know therefore that Jesus who bore our sins in his body when it says he's God. The word was God, the word became flesh, lived a perfect life and, and paid it all for us. That's why we talked last week about the greatest gift of love. The more the church reflected the more they realize that the resurrection is not possible without the incarnation. And so you started having the celebration in the sermons and on the Sundays from as early as Hippolytus in Rome and earlier where Clement talks about it in 79 AD. These things are historical. They're historical facts. And they're substantiated not only by Western astronomy and not Christian astronomers, secular astronomers, but by the Chinese astronomy and records that had no interest in what was going on. They didn't even know what was going on. So in conclusion for part three of the truth about Christmas, we have the truth about the days. We have the truth about the shepherds. We have the truth about the star, the signs in the heavens. We have the truth about the very people that came to visit, the Magi, and their influence, and their history, and their power, and the role they played at that time. So next week, we're going to conclude with the truth about Christmas, part four, anchoring it down in the Roman history of Saturninus and Quirinius and the census on into the ministry of Jesus Christ. Again, as Adolf von Harnack, the non-believing great Bible scholar who didn't believe in the resurrection of Christ, he didn't believe Jesus was God, but he came to conclude that Luke was extremely accurate, more accurate, accurate than any secular source. And what we have with the ministry of Jesus from his birth through his 12 year old testimony in the temple to his beginning of the ministry is we have a record that has stood all the criticism of the last 200 and some odd years. 
borne out as factual. The truth about Christmas is the good news and the joy that it is all true. Please bow with me. Father, we thank you for all these records and witnesses. We thank you for all these scholars that have worked so hard sometimes to disprove this only to find that they conclude that, that, that it is in fact real. We thank you for your word. We thank you most of all for your gift, which is Jesus Christ, your son. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, because of the blood of Jesus Christ, amen.